Actually, let's look towards each other more because it's better to do it this way. I want to welcome Hugh Locke to the Wilmot Institute's third live webcast over Facebook. This is being recorded. Watch out. <laughs> I'm joking. And I am so glad to see you because I haven't seen you since I think about 1992. I think the World Congress. We were even uh, talking on the phone because you had found Sorprop's papers, I think. Yes. We'll talk about that some other time. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's a really interesting story Whoa. in itself. Boy, that's a wild Actually, story. I would say something about that. So you found Ahmed Sorprop, the great covenant breakers, papers in the... I'll tell a story. And then... I was engaged at the time. And my wife had a, my, my fiance, now my wife, had a friend who was the, the daughter of uh, Julie Chandler. And, um, and, and so we were, you know, I, I met her socially, the daughter, whose name is Lily Townsend. And uh, Lily said, oh, I, I know something about the Baha'i And uh, uh, through my my grandmother, Julie Chandler, and her great friend, Ahmed Sora. So as soon as I heard those two names, I was like, ah! <laughs> no, 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 don't tell me anymore. I'll turn to salt. <laughs> so, but she said, well, you know, we've got all this stuff of, um, of Abdul Baha's and the, and I said, well, okay, but I don't, you know, in the back of my mind, I'm just thinking, red lights flashing, comment breakers. But gradually, so I called you, and, and then and I consulted with the National Assembly and the House of Justice, and, and they said, you know, proceed and explore to see what it is. And then the family, who were not actively covenant breakers, but they just said they had all the entire volume of stuff that Ahmed Sorab, as Abdul Baha's secretary, had collected. And kept when he shouldn't have, please. And, um, and so I went to see it, and it's in the basement of what they call the caravan house, which had by that time become an, an Italian language school. Nothing to do with comedy breakers again, but still with the family connection. And so um, the, the decision was at the request of the National Assembly that we should do um, an inventory because there was a legal process or transfer of something of this kind. As long as it was not, as long as it wasn't covenant breakers giving this stuff. So for, there was a, um, an archivist, what was his name? Richard, Richard Pollinger. Richard, yes. Richard yeah. And so we did a, an inventory, and so it, it involved every weekend my wife, Richard and I would go and we would carry stuff up to the dining room of the, this place from the base. And we would, and so there was, honestly, but it's just so amazing. Original tablets of Baha'u'llah. Baha'u'llah? With the, the handwriting because of the poison. Uh, wow. From Al Wow. The original, uh, the, 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 Minutes of the first meeting of the Baha'i Baha'is in North America following the 1893 thing in Chicago. Nobody knew that they existed. I haven't seen those. And then all of this correspondence. And then it also covered the period when Julie Chandler and Ahmed Sora became rather great. And um, of course, Julie Chandler was like insanely rich. <laughs> How else? Oh, you know. And um, so she did things like renting out the precursor to um, Lincoln Center and produced an opera called The Gate. Oh, rather like, I can't point to it because people can't see it's it. It's over there. The Gate is right the over gate. there. Yes. Yeah. So The yeah. Gate was a fully produced opera which they recorded. So there were, there were recordings. Uh, like records in the collection. But they were they created such a momentum that people like Einstein would pop into their meetings and Helen Keller and I mean because Julie was also very high society. 
So anyway, we got this whole thing inventory and uh, sent that off for, you know, powers to be. And then the procedure was that the family had to sign various documents at the National Center for Life, bequeathing the entire collection with no strings attached. And um, then we had to arrange to have it shipped. So it was, and I know the details because I arranged the shipping, it was um, two metric tons. It took, it was on flat, those things where you had to load them on a flatbed truck. Because it went into a, a room in the basement and floor to ceiling, it was just layered, packed. And they had never let anybody in in all the years after uh, Julie Chandler and Sora passed because they didn't because know. The yeah. Well, and then because the, the last kind of evidence of the caravan as an organization was like early 60s. But then even that eventually died out. But they never knew who to trust. But I mean, the, the, after that, the, the people who took over the Italian language school didn't know who to trust. They didn't have any interest in any of that stuff. But people were always knocking on the door, periodically, behind one of the acquire it. Some of whom I wouldn't say were stellar figures within the Baha'i um, universe. Uh, but nonetheless, they said no to all of them because they didn't know who was legit. And so then Lily, who still kept connections with the, the language school, um, said, no, 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 you can, you can trust them. So one day, I was, this is when I was working at the Baha'i session on the World Congress. A suitcase was delivered to my office from Lily. Because I, I hadn't yet decided that I, that I could cope with this, you know, because I still had the company bring with me. And then this suitcase arrived. And this was part of the archives that I hadn't seen yet, filled with the original clothing of Apple and dried blood of Apple in little packets. I have to say, I nearly passed out. <laughs> I can't imagine. Anyway. Well, I can't tell you that. Um, I guess they've got a lot of that organized. I know they copied everything and sent copies to the World Center or yeah. originals to the World Center or something. But Thornton Chase wrote some very interesting letters to Saw Rob with lots of details of his pre Baha'i life, which I had never seen before when I published my book, which I've only seen since. And really, some really interesting little insights about his life. And, and of course, I know about the tablets. Yeah. You know, but they it's say, a very important collection. I mean, we were told, and I'd be interested in your perspective on this, but just in, in its category, it was one of the most important finds of its kind outside of the immediate Absolutely. Baha'i. Absolutely. No question. No question. Yeah. So Rob was a trusted secretary of the Baha'i. He was receiving original tablets, he was translating them, he was not always sending either, he wasn't sending the originals to people, he was keeping the originals. We want to have original tablets of Abu Baha, we want what did Abu Baha say, all we have is a bad English translation, what is this word in English, what was it in the original yeah. Persian, now we can check. So it's it immensely also, important. It was interesting too that people kept copies of the letters they wrote. I mean, I don't know what, because of these bound editions of their letters to people. I don't know how they did that. Like, did they, did they have a carbon copy? Oh, yeah, the Gordon Chase would always type up letters with carbon copy. Oh. Sometimes he had, he'd make three or four copies of something in the yeah. like tablets, especially. There was also an interesting reference, which I've never heard explored further, and that was to do with the, the Duchess of Westminster in around the time that Alpha Ha went to London. Now, which Duchess of Westminster was it at that time? Was this a princess? No, 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 no. no. no I mean, what's her connection to the royal family? Because that's a pretty important title, right? So, no. no. Well, the, the Duchess of Westminster is not a member of the royal family. Okay. Um, but it is one of the most important um, dukedoms in England. And the Westminster family owns Mayfair. You know, in London, um, people don't own the land that their buildings are built on. They lease them from five 
estates. Still to this very day. For example, the old the old American embassy in the middle of London, they've, they've since built for It was the only embassy in the world where the US did not own the land outright. They leased it from the Duke of Messines. So I, during the time I worked with, cover, but, you know, with the royals, um, I knew that some of the investments just played. I didn't have enough information to say, you know, your great grandmother might have been, <laughs> um, but, but because there was some information there, but I never had a chance to really research it further, but very intriguing. Let's talk about that in a minute. <laughs> Let's finish the Yes, yes. Yes. Well, and then the entire thing went off. But the, to finalize it, the final thing was um, Julie Chandler was was um, Lily Townsend's grandmother. Lily's mother, um, named Elsita, her, her married name. Anyway, she was in her early 90s, and she didn't really feel terribly good about this whole process. But she wasn't really, you know, in a situation to be too involved in it. And she felt that the Baha'is had kicked her mother out. And so I said, well, you know, I think we should have a little bit of a, a reconciliation. Not for any purpose other than to clear the air. Because they'd made a very generous gift. And so um, Wilma then... Um, at BIC, Wilma Ellis, subsequently Wilma Fizentide, and Ferouz Fizentide. We had a tea at the Baha'i International Community offices in New York for Lily and her mother and my wife. And, um, and we gave them a Baha'i prayer book and we all signed it. And we explained from the Baha'i perspective what had happened. And that part of the story had never been conveyed to, to, to Lily and her mother. And um, I, at the time, was working on some projects with Anatole And I asked her for her recollections of that. And so she told me that she had gone on a mission from the Guardian to meet with Julie Chen. And, um, and so I was able to convey that part of the story in that meeting. <laughs> well, because Hanum said to me that she said, I sat down and, and Ahmed Sorbet was right there as she was talking to Julie Chen. And she conveyed a message from the Guardian and then Julie turned to Ahmed and said, are you really brainwashing me? This is a little anecdotal. And um, it, not in a kind of, it wasn't a confrontational setting, because even Anasar wouldn't try and stand up to the, <laughs> the force. But it was just a, you know, but she still you know, made a decision to continue. I don't know. Well, that's all right. Sorry, that. Yeah. You mentioned you worked for the Royals. This is earlier. This is in the late 80s, right? Yes, yes. And Prince Charles was involved in the environmental movement. The Baha'is were involved. That was Prince Philip. Prince Charles. I'm sorry, Prince Charles. I meant Prince Philip. I mean, I met Prince Charles. My first connection with the family is, of course, I come from a middle class family in the prairies in Canada, no social standing at all. <laughs> Wonderful upbringing, but never knew anybody. So when I started working with St. Barb Baker, he asked me to accompany him to Buckingham Palace to meet with Prince Charles. And that's all 1979, I think it was. And um, 78 or 79. And then afterwards, um, so I, you know, I had various dealings with him on behalf of St. Mark. And then in 1983, after St. Mark had passed, I asked um, Prince Charles if he and the Princess of Wales would um, 
take part in the event I was organizing in Canada. I was at that time working with children in forestry. And so they very kindly uh, were special guests in the thing I did. Very hard. But his first question, let's say Barbara had passed, and it had been a year since I'd seen Prince Charles, his first question in the midst of, you know, the audience of 20,000 people. <laughs> um, so sorry to hear about um, St. Barb's passing. So then, subsequently, when I was with the Baha'i International Community, started in New York, in New York starting in 1984, um, I didn't use the Prince Charles connection, but I I was able to meet Prince Philip, and um, he was just forming an interfaith initiative where major faith traditions were getting involved in helping to celebrate the 25th anniversary of the World Wildlife Fund, and he was the international president. And so I said, well, you know, can't the Baha'is be involved? And um, for some reason, we hit it off. I think possibly because the first time I met Philip, I disagreed with something that he said. And so I was very polite and deferential, but I said what I thought. And so we just hit it off. Because I subsequently worked with him, you know, for, for years. I hosted him. No, with him. But if you're not a, if you're not an employee, you're working with, him. and um, um, in several different contexts. And so I helped to host him in New York. We had, we had a lot of fun. I, I, he asked me to organize a um, to the launch of an organization um, because he was the president of the World Wildlife. This is separate from the uh, the interfaith stuff. So I helped to represent the faith in the Interfaith Initiative on Conservation and Religion under the umbrella of the World Wildlife Fund, which was launched in 88. And Pia Kanum met Prince Philip in that context. And then he, he was absolutely enchanted with him. Because when they met, so I set up this meeting for the two of them in, um, in Glow, Headquarters of the World Wildlife Fund. And the first thing that, the, that she talked about, she said, I, I, I feel that unless you can engage the indigenous peoples of the world in conservation, you're never really going to have a success. And after that meeting, he shared this with a mutual friend who then conveyed it to me that he was so impressed that said she, she went straight to the heart of the issue within the first five minutes of my meeting with her. And then his respect for her, I'll just tell you a little story because you know, royals, you know. So fast forward a couple of years, where I'm at a reception at St. James Palace and Rabia Khanu was there, officially representing the Baha'i community. And so that's a lot of people. So I, I see Prince Philip and, and you know, we just been together in New York. I mean, we were, he was on a first name basis with me. For him, it was your royal hands. So he's, he said, oh, you, you know, nice to see you. And I, he said, I understand that um, Madame Rabani is here. I said, yeah, she's in the, the next room. I, shall I go get her? And he said, no, I think I should go to her. Now, if you know anything about royal protocol. It's pretty amazing. It was, just, it was great to see her recognized for who she was. Yeah, exactly. What a marvelous opportunity <laughs> for serving faith to be able yes. to make those connections. What a privilege to be able to do that. Well, and, and, you know, with BIC, uh, the International Community, I was, I was kind of out there on a, on a very thin, little tenuous cord because we were breaking new ground. I mean, representing the faith <laughs> with the heads of all these different religious communities, all of whom got to wear great costumes, I have to say. And jewelry, the best I could do was Armani. You know? I, I at least wanted a hat. Anyway. <laughs> I mean, the Pope always looks so cool, you know. Not even a ring did I get. 
so um, often, because the, when the Office of Public Information was new, so I'd be in meetings. I remember one time I was meeting with the uh, representatives of the Club of Rome. Urban, yes. No, that's how Urban came in. No, no. I, no, no. I, well, anyway, that's another story. But, but my, the first contact was with me, for Urban, in my capacity. But it was a, he was like wandering the hallways in the thing in San Francisco. A bunch of, anyway, back to. So I would be in these situations and I would be representing the people. And I would be just terrified of making some commitment that wasn't appropriate or didn't align with the writings. I, you know, because this was like, I, I would leave, I would step out of meetings and I would call the bus <laughs> And I would say, excuse me, I'm so sorry, but um, how would you advise I, I deal with the following question, which is currently in negotiation in the meeting that I'm in? And again, so sorry. And then, I would get an answer, and they would themselves say, "Okay, this is the." It was uh, heady stuff. Amazing. <laughs> yes. Amazing. Exactly. So now you'll step back, see Mark Baker. Yes. Okay. Um, how did you meet Mark Baker? And this was what, like '69, also. Nineteen? No, that was early. Nineteen seventy. It's in the book. It, it, I think it's '76. It must have been 76, yeah. I was working, I was in between degrees, and I was working in, in Regina, Saskatchewan. And um, St. Barb was coming through, I'd never heard of it. But um, I went to this, I, I was active in the Baha'i community there, and I went to this thing and met him, and, um, and I was intrigued with him. And so during his the same visit, he, um, he was staying with the Baha'i couple. They had to be away for the day, and they said, could I come and be his host for the day? I didn't, so I, again, you know, it was fun. Um, and he was working on a book at the time, and he asked me to read him his written, handwritten notes about the chapter he was working on, on show me sorry. So I read it to him, and he said, well, what do you think? And I said, uh, you know, I'm not gonna. I said, I don't think it really hangs together very well, you know, with all due respect. I mean, I'm fascinated because this is close to my heart. But you know, you asked. Anyway, again, we hit it off. <laughs> you, know, you know how to disagree with people gracefully. Yeah, you have to be very polite. But um, so then I helped him rewrite that section, and then I, I said, so we, we should we should continue this. And so I knew that he was going to be in England. I was about to, to go to school, so we agreed to meet the following summer. And then, um, and then, I mean, I'll, I'll tell you this story. This is not in the book. We met in London in uh, like September, no, July. Anyway, but that summer, the next summer, and I, and I traveled with him a bit, you know, because I was there before starting my school in September. We traveled around and we really hit it off, and, uh, and it was fun. And I was meeting all these amazing people. And I was assisting him with, you know, yeah, scheduling. No, no, 80s. And, um, but then he went back to New Zealand because he lived with, there with his wife. And he wrote me a letter. And that Christmas, I was at a house party where one of the other guests was a graphologist who specialized in handwriting analysis for ransom notes with the FBI. So as you can imagine, everybody was giving her handwriting stuff to him, which is not very polite, but anyway. And I thought, well, I don't really, I, I want to give her a test. So I took this letter from Sue, and she couldn't see who it was, not that she would have known anyway. And she read this, and she said, this man is thinking about committing suicide. I said, first of all, he's a Baha'i, and, and if you're fully embracing the Baha'i faith, you know that's one option you don't have, no matter how tough things are. So he, no, no, she said, it's not that he's going to kill himself, He's going to let go. And he's saying between the lines, so to speak, in this letter, that if you help him, he will stay alive. 
This was the letter he wrote to you? Yeah, but he didn't say that. She was interpreting this, the FBI handwriting expert. So I thought about this, and I said, well, oh, these things happen for a reason. So I wrote him a letter, and I said, dear St. Barb, I think you should let me help you organize the remaining years of your life. And I proposed the following three priorities. Number one, I think you should get your message to a, a younger audience, because it's, it's timely, and you're not out there. Number two, I think you should organize all your papers and stuff, because I was with you last summer, and I know that there's stuff stashed in the closets and bar and all over the place. And I'll help you organize that. And um, number three, I think you should let me help organize a world tour every year. And so that's what we did for five years. Well, and the... The, um, I mean, just one other story because this connects St. Barb to my family. So, the very first time I went to Buckingham Palace was with St. Barb to meet Prince Charles. So, when you come up to the palace, you go to a little ante room on the right hand side of the facade. And then the actor, the private secretary of the prince, came to retrieve St. Barb and I and then took us through the inner courtyard. It's an open courtyard, but very, very big. And we were going pretty corner across to the stairwell entrance to Prince Charles' private office. So, but I was very close to my maternal grandfather, but he'd been dead. And um, that's part of the story. So we, the three of us are walking across the court, very crunchy ground, and I'm just, nervous beyond words, because at this point, I met the Prime Minister of Canada, but nobody else. It's like, boy from the prairies, you know? 3,000 people on a good day in the little town I grew up on. <laughs> it was Saturday night when everybody was there for shopping. So, I was just extraordinarily nervous, and my stomach was a loss. My, literally, I was shaking. I was just trying to hold it together. I'm going into a private meeting room. So about a quarter of the way across the courtyard with the equerry, St. Barbara and myself, I felt my grandfather walking beside me. I had never experienced this before or since. I'd never asked for it. I, I was just so shocked. Because as far as I was concerned, there was no question he was there in all but physical form, walking in step. And a feeling of complete calm came over me. And that calm has stayed with me my, throughout my life in working with all the famous people I've worked with. So I went into the meeting with Prince Charles. The equerry left. It was Prince Charles, St. Barb, and me for an hour and a half. And I had no more nerves than sitting here with you. And I worked for Kishan Gorbachev, I worked for Dalai Lama, all of these people. And that was my grandfather's gift that came by a St. Barb. What a marvelous And now let's jump forward to St. Barb inspiring you to be working on reforestation. <laughs> well, I'd been working on a, on a humanitarian program in Haiti from 2005, but I was feeling as though I wasn't really living up to my mentors inspiration. And so I found somebody in Haiti, a, a, a agronomist named uh, Timothée Georges, and we were both you know, deciding we should do something about tree planting. And so we formed an organization and we approached farmers to plant trees. But they were like, no, 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 we're not interested, go away. And we said, no, no, we'll give you free trees. No, nope, still not interested. And so we had to figure out a way to, to get them interested. Out of that came a whole kind of, what's turned out to be quite a revolutionary thing because we're, we've developed a kind of tree currency, an alternate economy, where farmers grow, transplant, and look after trees as a way to earn uh, credits that they turn in for seeds and tools and training and livestock. And now it's becoming a much, we have about 6,000 members now 
but we're scaling up to about I don't know, 30,000 over the next couple of years, and we're turning it into a business rather than a non-profit. Everything will be paid for through profits. No, but you know, it did, I mean, St. Barbara, this is what his genius was. He could figure out how to, how to insert himself into the cultural DNA of any group. And he just, that was how he worked with the Messiah. But all over the, the world, he, he never imposed. He, he figured a way in so that they owned it. Culturally appropriate, yeah. And, you know, they hadn't come up with it on their own, but he could catalyze that. And uh, yeah, they were with their So I, I feel his, his example is particularly relevant now because there are so many breathtakingly bad development initiatives. USAID, not exclusively, but I mean, they're among the worst in the world right now. They will go into a community and they, with the best of intentions, but they pay farmers to farm the way they want them to farm. And then when they leave, it's like nothing. So I'm trying to, to promote this idea that, you know, we need to find a new way to work with small scale farms, small mobile farms, but also understand how they got where they are, because it's not an accident. And despite 60 years of pressure to completely eradicate small mobile farms, there are still, and, and, and you know, as I'm gonna to say tomorrow in my farm, when the world had a panic attack in the early 60s, because somebody realized that we were gonna run out of food by the 1990s based on population growth and, and food production, that's when the whole world said, okay, well, let's rally behind industrial scale farming, which saved the world because a global disaster was averted. But now we're still paying the cost. One of the details of that movement was to say you've got to stop providing. I know. And I just came yeah. over to give my condolences yeah. to you. And and we we're very sad. We met yeah. him and he was in our community, yeah. Davidson, and we just found yes. out yes. and we're really sad. So I just wanted to come over. I just wanted to come over and offer him like was it unexpected? He had liver cancer and apparently it was just over a few weeks. Okay. I didn't know that. All right. Well give his condolences. Our our to Kate and Jim and family. Okay. Well, God bless you. Okay. <laughs> All right. Bless you. Sure. Continue. So you've got this, this kind of juggernaut of industrial scale agriculture, which met some needs, but yeah. with some side effects that nobody really anticipated. And those side effects have been getting bigger and bigger. But one of the deals was with the support for industrial scale agriculture's expansion that developing countries were supposed to let go of supporting domestic agriculture. And so basically 60 years of trying to get rid of smallholder farms. So now today, 500 million smallholder farms throughout the developing world. And the people who live and work on those farms add up to two and a half billion. So that's a third of humanity. So what is it that, that they couldn't be gotten rid of? And I think it's because it's something about you know the human condition that you have to stay connected to the land. So I have a garden in my not quite backyard. It's actually on city land, and it's 15 feet wide and 40 feet long, and that doesn't include the water. doesn't include the peach trees, the asparagus, the red raspberries, the black raspberries, the blackberries, the, the grapes, uh, the rhubarb. Uh, I was raised I on a farm. I was raised on a farm, and that connection to land is very important to me. So, to me, the, the, there's this great, you know, huge swath of the human family that have been invisible for 60 years. 
And so what I stumbled across in Haiti by accident was one possible route to re-engage with because the way we've set it up, they're able to focus on, to help address three really critical problems. Number one, grow more food, organically. Number two, contribute to combating climate change because they're both growing more food organically and they're planting, we've planted seven million trees so far in the last couple of years. And then thirdly, um, working towards gender equality because We've insisted that men and women, when they farm together, are separate but equal members. It's not, a, not easy to do when we started out, because that's not the tradition. And so now what I'm suggesting beyond the borders of Haiti is we have an opportunity to re-engage with a third of humanity in a way that will help us selfishly meet food security, combating climate change, and building enough of a threshold level of gender equality that will all benefit. And this can be done. Cities will continue to grow into enormous, into yeah. enormous favelas. And the lack of infrastructure in those cities and crime, just the problems of putting 20 million people in a little area, many cities are that size. Really. So that's my, the land. that's my, my life's work which was initiated by St. Barb, and it took me a little while to get back to it. But all the lessons I've learned and all the people I've worked with, to me, it's all basically because this is why I'm here on Earth. Awesome. That's a fantastic story. <laughs> Thank you I so didn't much. expect to be sharing so many details. It's all right. I'm delighted. I am. I'm delighted that you did. I'm proud. Thank you very much for this time together and uh, all of these very, very interesting anecdotes. Uh, we're very grateful. So let me end our conversation and uh, thank you again. And uh,